Hey guys, at this time, uh, let's welcome up to the stage representing Bigger Pockets. We got David, Joshua, and Brandon. Let's give them a big round of applause, guys. Here we go. Here we go. This is the Bigger Pockets podcast. This hey, is this the is Bigger my, Pockets my podcast. Show, my show. This. You retired. I Thank did you. retire. What's going on, everyone? So, um, how many of you, and I know not, you won't hurt my feelings, it's okay, I know this isn't a uh, Bigger Pockets event, but how many of y'all have listened to at least an episode of the Bigger Pockets podcast? Holy wow. cow. Wow. I'm All sorry. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, for those who don't know, so my name is Brandon Turner. This here is, one more time. <laughs> not Brandon Turner. <laughs> this is David Green. This is David the Man Green, and... I'm Josh Dorkin. All right, so Josh Dorkin, for those who are relatively new to the Bigger Pockets podcast, Josh was the host... Uh, for the first five years, along with me as the co-host, uh, a year ago, Josh stepped down, uh, decided to, you know, be a big shot and go ski more often. And uh, we brought in David Green here, uh, who actually I met through, really through GoBundance. This is like a GoBundance love story right here. Uh, <laughs> because, like, I mean, I think it came from Hal Elrod, who you had met through GoBundance, and then you and I hung out. Was... Yeah, Hal Elrod to Bigger Pockets to GoBundance to yeah. now. Yeah. He anyway. talks about how much he loves you a lot. A lot. A lot. It's awkward. So we thought it would be fun today uh, to kind of join the two worlds together here and do a, uh, we'll call it a live podcast recording, though we're not technically live to the rest of the world, but our show currently gets somewhere in the neighborhood of 250,000 downloads per episode. So we're going to take this recording and the video and we're going to throw it up on uh, as an actual episode of the Bigger Pockets podcast. Uh, so hopefully we get a nice quarter million people to hear about the cool things that are going on here and kind of the story of how it all got started uh, through these three good looking gentlemen. So that is the plan today. He's looking so... at me when he said that. <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. There you go. All right. So we're, uh, we've actually never had all three of us interview anybody before. I'm actually three intimidated. People. Yeah, you should be. That Have is... you been next to David Green before? It's awkward. It's a big man. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So we're going to start this thing just from the beginning of how we would normally start our podcast. Uh, we welcome, I mean, uh, audience, you know, if you hear something you like, you can clap, you can laugh, you can, you know, boo if you want. It's okay. Uh, it kind of makes for the fun, kind of the live feel of the show. So... Uh, that's all I got. You got anything before we get going? It looks like you trimmed the beard. I did trim the beard. I know. It's looking I mean, handsome. Yeah, a little more presentable. Yeah. So, yeah. Just for you guys. For you. There's also beard oil in this. Yeah, that's right. Which is your new business, right? <laughs> Beardy Brandon's Beard Oil. There you yes, go. Exactly. There you go. Yeah, let's kick this thing off. All right, here we go. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online. What's going on, everyone? My name is Brandon Turner, the host of the Bigger Pockets podcast, here with my co hosts today. Never said that before in my life. Is that even a Sounds word? Sounds good. Sounds good. Joshua Dorkin and David Green. This is the first time I've been a co-host. This is the first time you've been a co-host. Yes. I was wondering how well that was going to go over. I'm a little yeah. disappointed. I don't know if I want to be in between you guys. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't feeling good, guys. This is going to be good. All right. So for those people listening to this, uh, I guess, podcast here, uh, this might sound a little different. Maybe the quality is a little different because right now we are actually recording this on stage in front of a bunch of really thousands thousands tens of okay there's i don't know what 150 like people 16 <laughs> people in the room <laughs> mom there's a couple grandma, hundred there's a couple hundred auntie, people thank you guys for showing up there's a couple hundred good looking gentlemen in this room we are at the annual winter go abundance event can i get a shout out or cheer for that yeah. grab a life pick Woo. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. all right so what is what is go abundance we'll talk about that in a minute but before we get into that, we're actually interviewing uh, three people. So yes, there are six people on today's podcast episode, and we're going to be talking a lot about wealth building, but not in the way that you might think. We're not going to be just spending the whole time talking about how to make more money in our bank account, so I'm sure that will come up. We're going to talk about what wealth really is uh, in all of its different forms. And uh, we money? have Money is one of them, but we'll, we'll that's, expand. That's, that's it, right? That's all there is, Josh. That's it. So we will introduce our guests in just a moment. Before we do, uh, I want to get to today's Quick tip. All right. Today's quick tip is very simple, and it's based on what we're going to talk about today a little bit. 
If you do not have a group of people, whether it's two people, five people, or 150 people that you can regularly get together with and have hold you accountable to your goals and your plans and your dreams, you should probably get that. You know, we've all heard that quote, you are the average of the five people you associate with the most. And it's uh, been really, really apparent to me being part of this group, this GoBundance group. And I know, as our three guests are about to probably tell us, hopefully that's been an important part of your lives as well. So let's get to today's interview. Now, I'm going to actually let you guys in, uh, introduce yourselves. Because obviously, he doesn't know your names. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, uh, if, if you are not watching this on YouTube right now, you're listening to the audio version of this, uh, it might be a little bit confusing to hear who's talking. So let's all of us try today, when you're talking, say who you are before saying something. But uh, why don't we start with the, we call them the three amigos. We'll have you guys introduce each other in whatever, whatever order you guys feel are the best looking to the worst. Go. All right, best looking to the worst. I'm, <laughs> I'm David Osborne, best looking. And, uh, of course, David went first. Great to be with you. All right. Pat Hyben. Tim Rode. All right. Now, some of these names may sound familiar because we've had both David and Pat on the podcast, and Tim will probably be on again. Yes. Uh, but if you've been a faithful listener of Bigger Pockets, you should recognize some of these people. And it's kind of cool to see how the relationship between Brandon and I and the three amigos is going to be tied together. There we nice. go. Notice he didn't include me. <laughs> I have no relationship. <laughs> Josh is like the substitute teacher today, who showed up on the same day as the regular teacher, so it's really uncomfortable. All right, so. <laughs> All right. Sad. Yeah, sad. All right, so let's go through. I want to actually, before we, you know, you introduce who you are, but now tell us real quick, who are you in, in under a minute? Like, tell us your life story in under a minute, kind of where, where you got to. And then I want to transition that. You guys can transition it, your big boys, on how you met each other and how that got to where we are today. I know it's a lot to cover in like a couple minutes, but cool. Ahead. I was the kid in the back of your class throwing spit wads at you, not paying attention. Um, nice. Woke up at 25. I'm a grocery clerk with two part or two kids working part time as a grocery clerk. Found my niche selling real estate. Sold a lot of houses. Lived like a grocery clerk. Retired at 40, financially free. Ski. I was a ski bum for 10 years. Started one life. Helped start GoBundance. Wow, that was good. Nice. That's awesome. And I learned everything I know from these two guys on either side of me. So I took after Tim. Basically, I was a real estate agent from 21 years old. Rose all the way up through to be the number one agent in the world at Remax, then the number one agent in the world at Keller Williams, then retired at 46. Wrote my book, Six Steps to Seven Figures. Woo! Then when, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> then I uh, um, went on book tour, basically uh, became an investor. Uh, full-time investor, and now I have a, a podcast where I help real estate agents sell more houses in a online company uh, called Rebus University where we train agents how to make more money. And, uh, of course, I'm a, a founder in this beautiful company, GoBundance. I'm David Osborne. I'm the father of three wonderful kids, uh, two daughters and one son, and I'm married to a wonderful wife who puts up with me. I built uh, with many partners one, Smokey Garrett as well, the fourth largest residential real estate company in the U.S. We sell $10 billion worth of real estate a year. And then I wrote a book called Wealth Can't Wait, New York Times bestseller, and also a founder of GoBundance. And let's get right into how we started. 21 years ago, I'm new to the business. I just opened my first full franchise from the ground up. And I'm in a class. I've been a class junkie my entire life. I've needed to learn. Like, like Tim, I was a terrible high school and college student. But once I got into business, I became the most avid learner you would ever meet. And this class taught us to be accountable to one other person. They said, pick a peer partner out of this room, look for another person, and that person's gonna be your peer partner. Little did I know that at that moment in 1997, I looked across the room, I saw a guy, he had hair back then, and I gave him the man nod, and the man nod kinda like this. Men know it, I don't know if women do it, but I know men do it. We're like, whoa, what's up? And it means I'm cool, are you cool? Like, maybe we should be friends. <laughs> and if they don't nod back, you don't go over and talk to them. But Pat fortunately gave me the man nod back, and we became friends. And what this guy taught us was to be peer partners. He said, you guys have to hold one another accountable. You will be coaches for one another, non-paid, paid in time meet, meet equally, and you will hold each other accountable to the commitments you make in your life. We held each other accountable since 1997, now for 22 years. And it's been a relationship that has been one of the top five most transformative relationships in my life. Hey, can, can I ask you a question on that? So you did the nod. You saw him. There was the bromance. Yep. What if it didn't work out? You know, most people didn't work out. The interesting, we were in this class for six of eight years. It was a mastermind. 
most people we saw would fall into a peer partnership and they would just become friends. They didn't become accountability partners. But the message the guy was trying to teach us is, and I loved it when a guy got up earlier and said, my peer partners kicked my ass. Pat would kick my ass on a regular basis. And he taught me the value of, of keeping my word in business. If, if I say I'm gonna do something, that you don't need a friend that says, oh, it's okay, you didn't get it done, no big deal. You need a friend that you said, I said I was gonna make 20 calls this week. And then at the end of the week, you haven't made a single call. The guy needs to get an email out to you that says, look, are you just gonna be like everyone else that, walks the, that talks the talk but doesn't walk the walk? Or are you actually gonna do what you said you're gonna do? And that relationship was a sharpening of one another that lasted well, for 22 years. And a lot of people spin out by that. You know, and we had that. We had other people try to join us. They spin out by that. And that's the majority of the public spins out when people call them out, you know, on their BS. Yeah. So, so, you know, all the people listening to the show right now are probably wondering what actually kept you guys together. Why, why did you guys work? You know, I, I can go and, you know, I mean, this, this guy was my peer partner and it, whoop, it worked out, I guess, or something. Um, <laughs> kind of. But most, most relationships, most business relationships don't work, right? So, so what, it, what, what was the connection between you guys and what can you share to somebody listening uh, who's, who's actually looking for that person that, that they can work with? So my dad said the reason he stayed married to my mom for 50 years was because they didn't both fall out of love with each other at the same time. <laughs> There were times one fell out of love with the other, but never both at the same time. With Pat and I, we had moments where we would fall off the wagon, we wouldn't have accountability, but one of us was always kind of drawing the other one back in. So we never quit on each other at the same time. Sometimes we were pretty weak partners, other times we were amazing. And the second thing we did is reinvent the relationship on a regular basis. When we got bored of the emails, we started going to seminars together. When we got bored of the seminars, we started doing trips together. Yeah, and, and you know, we felt at that time that there was nobody else that we could really share the stuff that we were sharing. It was proprietary to us. We were wrong, obviously. Look at this room now. Right, right. These people all are sharing their net worths and their, how much money they're making every month from rentals and everything else, right? And all this stuff. But at the time, it was proprietary. It was like, nobody wants to talk about this but us. So it, it, we gravitated with that. And then we found Tim and we're like, hey, here's a dude. The first day we met him, he's talking about all his damn rental properties, his auto zone, his Dollar General store. And we're like, man, this is a great we need to hang out with this kid more often and what tim brought which was even more important to us really was health like pat and i would compete on number of hours worked dollar productive hours how many assets we bought but we were really all about business and then we went to a money matters conference and pat met tim and he's like i think i found a guy that can fit in with us and what tim was done he'd already retired he was living in the woods we called him the backcountry billionaire because he rode his bike every day and he skied and he brought an element of health to us that we didn't have at that point i'm fitter now than I ever was when I first met Tim. <laughs> yeah, that's, the, that's my thing is getting the goods in the woods. And um, I, money's great, but there's a heck of a lot of stuff out there that, you know, you make good money and do well with your investing so you can live a marvelous life. So, so that's one of the most appealing parts of GoBundance is it's not just focused on growing your net worth or growing your passive income. But you're doing it for the purpose of having a better life, right? Like if your why is big enough, it can drive you through all the obstacles that prevent you from succeeding in things like business. And a lot of listeners to this podcast, they're facing that frustration of, I know what I need to do, but I just can't do it. And I feel like a lot of the time their why isn't big enough or they don't have a vision of what they want it to look like. Can you guys tell us a little bit about how GoBundance ties into that, the principles of GoBundance and how they basically like tie into helping you accomplish your goals? I'd, I'd love to touch on that. In 1997, I had a magnificent future vision. I dreamed I would be living up in the hills with an amazing, magnificent view. I'd be uh, getting the goods in the woods daily, taking care of my family, and find uh, some meaningful way to give back. And I wrote all that in 97, and by 2004, it was a reality. And, and that's, like you said, you have to have an amazing vision that gets you up every morning saying, let me at them. I love that. I love that. So the way that ties in, though, is we, we, we all found as you achieve success in life, and I think everyone in this room has probably experienced this, you become lonely. You become alone. You get isolated. And the reason is most of your friends aren't willing to do what you're doing to get to where you want to go, right? And that's not good or bad. You didn't, you know, you have your high school buddies, 
and then your college buddies, and then you're driving. And, and I think Pat and I, it worked because we were so ambitious. We wanted to be more. We were pushing each other to grow. And I got so lucky in Pat. He was the greatest peer partner of all time. I think he's slightly psychopathic. He loves, <laughs> he loves kicking my ass when I'm not doing what I said I was gonna do. It was like, and I was like so glad about that because then by the law of reciprocation, if he screwed up in the littlest way, I was able to jump right back in. But we, we found that that ambition is a double-edged sword. Money's only good for the money for the good money can do, but having a lot of money makes a lot of things easier. If you wanna make a difference in a charity, you can give a bunch of money. If you wanna go on a vacation, it's a great vacation. If you wanna educate your kids or get them ski lessons, it's way easier with money than without. Have you seen the prices at this resort? So, so we, uh, we just kinda of became like closer and closer. We didn't start off as friends, we started off as accountability partners, but suddenly we were you know, just leaving our friends behind and, and you either had to be half the person you were around them, some few were cool with it, or you had to like lie or just not be fully yourself, or there's the risk that your friends are like, man, you're becoming a jerk. All you do is talk about your money and your vacations. I'm like, well, what am I supposed to talk about? I'm yeah. like working jerk. all the time and, <laughs> yeah, sorry. <What>? Nothing. <laughs> that was awesome. Um, all right. <laughs> Did I cut them off? It's good. You Sorry. should. Good. All right. Hey, so listen. So we're talking about this organization. We're talking about GoBundance. But, you know, at the end of the day, the listeners don't necessarily care too much about the organization. But I think they're going to – many of them will, and I think – I ho hope they investigate and look into it. But beyond that, I think the pillars of the organization yeah. are what are so valuable about this group. And, yeah, for and sure. It, it, it's, I think, what – you know, David and, and Brandon have both – Chatted, Brandon, uh, you know, continues to bloviate about lots of things, <laughs> including... Says the guy who's still talking. GoBundance. <laughs> this is my time. Um, anyway, so I'm going to read the pillars of GoBundance, and then we're going to go through each of these pillars, and we're going to chat with you guys about them, what they mean, and, and how people can kind of bring this into their own lives. So the first pillar is age-defying health, then authentic relationships, bucket list adventures, oh yeah, extreme accountability... Genuine contribution and horizontal income, which we will also define. So, yeah, why don't, uh, we, why don't we start with the last one? Yeah, right. The horizontal. That. I say that because a lot of people are now going, wait, horizontal income, what does that mean? Let's talk about that. So, all, out of these six pillars, who wants to kind of define what horizontal, horizontal income is? Horizontal income is just the opposite of vertical income. Everybody has a job where they get a 2% raise, 3% raise every year, or you work harder, you sell more in your business, and you make more money. That's going up. Vertically, this is horizontal. It's coming in sideways. Obviously, rental properties are horizontal. Maybe a business that you own that you don't work in is horizontal. And our goal has always been to try to get as many lines as you can so that they pay your personal bills and then you don't have to work financially free. Hey, Pat, what's the difference between horizontal and passive income? Is it the same thing? Same exact thing. Okay. It's a good term, though. I like it. All right. David so, just cool, came I up like with a I like my cool definition term. better. Though. Well, yeah. horizontal, you can lay on your back and receive checks. We thought that was kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, I like nice. it. Horizontal. Dude, that's, that's clever. All right. So uh, horizontal income. So what do you guys have for horizontal income, generally speaking? Can you, you don't have to say everything, but maybe just say who you are and what you have for that right now. You don't need to say how much. It just means Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just like what, what, what are what's the been your focus for that? Right. Uh, single family, right? A multifamily. Um, what have you got? 42 Retail. Streams? I've got like, yeah, 40 some, depending on the day, whatever, lines of income coming in horizontally. Some are businesses, uh, probably 10 are businesses, five are notes, six are apartment buildings, one shopping center, 12 houses, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, my, I probably got like 30 streams of income coming in. My whole gig is how can I work as little as possible on making money and water skiing in other people's wake like David Osborne and Andrew Cushman and stuff and let them, you know, and David's got brilliant people and they, and they make me a lot of money so I can spend all my time getting the goods in the woods and, and, and helping make a real difference in, the, in communities all over America. Boom! Nice. nice. Yeah. <laughs> David? David Osborne, I got over 150 streams of income. Damn, son. And what, what, what are some of those? Like, just so people have an idea. Single family rentals, which we all came from single family. We love it. I still love it to this day. Multifamily. I own 14 franchises, five master franchises. I have a private equity firm. I have an insurance company. I have intellectual property. I have an... Um, I think that's it. You wrote a book? But the, but the 150 you know, the does... Yeah, 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 the book. You, yeah. you lumped all your single families into one. 
No, no, no. I counted them separate because you always uh, bust uh, my nuts okay. if I don't. <laughs> I normally just say, I, because I, have, I thought it was I like 95 single family homes. So 95 of those 150 are single family. The other 55 are businesses of various kinds. So, so for somebody listening, I mean, this is intimidating. I mean, I, I could imagine like you're, you've, you've never done this. You're working a nine to five job and you're like, oh, this is crazy. I mean, like, uh, I'm not going to be a cajillionaire with, like these guys. Like, how, you, know, you know, how does somebody? It's not a real word. I know. Yes, yeah, shut up. <laughs> we like that. I'm real allowed, words. I'm allowed to shut up. Okay, so <laughs> this is my show. Um, <laughs> what was was? Your show. Oh wow! Wow! <laughs> wow! It's, Whoa! So how does somebody? <laughs> how does somebody who's, you know, who's working a nine to five job? How does somebody begin to transition? to a place where they can start to feasibly begin to build these. You know, I'm working nine to five, I've got you know, a family, I, I've got obligations. How do I find the time to start to build this horizontal income? I mean, it's, I, I can't even conceptualize it. How do I do that? Well, just to put it in perspective, Tim, did you graduate college? I, I barely graduated high school and never went to a day of college. Was it in the woods? <laughs> it was in the woods, Portola, California, in the house. <laughs> so, so just there's not any exceptional like you know human beings up here. It's just people that got started early on building one stream of income at a time. My first one was 1995. When was your first one? My first one was 1983. It was, it was when the uh, 1981 when the Niners won their first Super Bowl. Yeah, <laughs> when was you celebrated by buying a house? 1990. <laughs> So it sounds intimidating because of the 20 plus years we've been really dedicated to adding these streams. But if you just start with one and you get around the right peer group that make, it seems easy when you're suddenly meeting guys or like we meet that are like, oh, I got 15 properties. Like, wow, if that guy's got 15, I should be able to have 20. Dollar cost average. And, and I've never seen a better model of this ever than David Green sitting right here. And, and the Indeed. whole thing he did better than anybody I've ever met is, you know, as his income went up and, and he worked really hard, but he lived way below his means. Yeah. And uh, Vince Lombardi said, defense wins championships. And most people don't know what's coming in, what's going out, what's left to invest. And that's the key to the whole thing. It's a simple, basic formula. So we have something yeah. called 100% or the goal is to have 100% of your monthly expenses covered by passive income. Then you're free. You can do whatever you want. You can be charitable. You can take your whole time off and ski. You can spend all your time with your family. But one of our goals is for everyone to be 100%er. Yeah. yeah, I really like that because yeah, once you have that freedom, once this is Brandon, by the way, once you step outside of having to have a nine to five job, you can choose to have a nine to five job or you can choose to do whatever you want. Like, that's when life gets really, I don't know if fun is the right word, but meaningful maybe in a lot of ways. And not that a job can't be meaningful, but there's just something about having the freedom to explore those other things. A lot of people say, you know, well, money doesn't make you happy. Well, it's, it's true. But like you said earlier, it does make things easier. I'm really um, glad yeah. I made a lot of money before I figured out the money doesn't yeah. make you happy. <laughs> well, okay. I'll, on that note, I have actually uh, a question on that so all three of you guys worked uh you know at least you mentioned like you two and i'm assuming tim as well but worked really hard at some point like we worked a ton of hours and you really you know and now that you're well off and you know we're all millionaires now it's easy to talk about oh you know age defined health and bucket list adventures that's really easy to talk about but what about the guy sitting there who's got a net worth of negative 75 dollars you know like how does how do the pillars and living a becoming a wealthy across different things how does that play into it in your opinion don't go on a bucket list adventure yeah don't is, is that what, yeah is that what you said don't don't do those things we or? think we think almost everyone has to do 20 years in 10 i mean I, I don't know another way to do it i don't know another way than to work 70 80 hours a week for at least 10 years and save your ass off and yeah, save your money. well below, your, below means, your means save money and then invest that money yeah. And, and as our coach dr fred gross taught us it's dollar productive activity it's spending you your time doing the things that make you money and delegate the rest. Can you, explain is, that? Yeah. Yeah, can you guys talk about that just a minute longer? Spend the time, because I know it's like, that's a really important thing for wealth building, to spend the time thing that makes Real you money. Real estate is the everyday man's way to wealth, in my opinion. Like, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. You just have to be disciplined, live well below your means, play defense. We all live below our means. My car was always secondhand. I, was, I used to be embarrassed to walk to my car after recruiting appointments. I'd wait till the agent left because I was so embarrassed about my car I drove. This is my mom's car. <laughs> so, is, is, you know, so wealth isn't like showing off your, your Bugatti. Wealth isn't, you know, blinging around and, and you know, looking, look looking fly. Well, I mean, you look fly. <laughs> yeah. you look, look at that. Freaking look at it. Like a, a porn fisherman, fed. but, you know. <laughs> um, 
No, but there's another really big piece of that. And, and that's like where you are, be where you are. You know, and so many people, when they're at work, they're, think, they're online looking at their vacation. And they're on vacation and they're checked into work. And that was another thing Dr. Fred taught us is, is always be where you are. And, and I'd like to say one other thing. And that's um, anybody listening to this is absolutely on the right track. I never spent a dime um, or a minute learning about the periodic tables, WTF. Um, <laughs> however, um, what to do with what I make fascinated me. And I spent a lot of time learning how to invest. And, that's the, and if you're listening to this, you get this already. Well, I think that there's a lot of truth to the, the point that when most people are at their job and they're working, they're really not 100% focused on what they're doing. In fact, I would say if you looked at your eight hours of work that the typical person puts in, they do 15 to 20 percent of that time actually working. The rest of it is unfocused activities. If you have a big goal, you know you want to be a real estate investor, you don't want to buy a property. If you get really good at the job you already have and you can get eight hours of work done in two or three hours, there's no reason why you shouldn't be pursuing your other goals as long as you're meeting your obligations. Josh, you run a company. You're about to tell me that I shouldn't yeah, be telling what people Yeah, what the hell this. are you <laughs> I'll tell you, there's people who That's work... That's some four-hour work we pay somebody to do your job business. <laughs> I know. There's people that work at Craig and Auto Parts, and when nobody's walking in the store and there's nothing to do, they sit around, they look at their phone, they go on Facebook. They're not doing productive activities, whereas if they took that time and focused it on what's my goal, where do I want to get there, and then brought accountability into their life because they know someone's going to be calling me at the end of the week to ask if I did what I was going to do, their life would look completely different. And for whatever reason, there's a lot of people that don't even understand that's a thing. And when you get around other people who think that way and are that way, you start to notice that there's tons of opportunity in your own life that you didn't even see was there. Set financial goals, not material ones. And, and I would just say, don't do what he said. When you're at the job, <laughs> do your work because your boss will get angry. But, I mean, Tate, look, we all, we all putz around and do unproductive stuff, and, sure. and, and you're completely right. And, and, um, but, you know, as, as an employer, I would say try and be present for your job. Um, but so, so you can only do your employees don't, don't listen to the podcast. Yeah, don't worry. Yeah. You work but, for us. But, no, I mean, but look, you, you should be taking time and, and thinking, right? I mean, I think that's one of the things that all of us who are successful, you know, in this room – do more than the people who are unsuccessful, right? It's, it's we stop and we actually think, right? And it's not just I'm, I'm in the job and I'm, you know, what do you like to say, watching uh, Desperate Housewives or Dancing with Dance the Stars? Dancing with the Stars. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like, in, instead of going home and doing that, we're, we're thinking, right? We're planning. We're plotting. How can we do that? Okay, you could do a little bit of work. But, like, you, you know, that's, I think, what needs to happen, taking that time that most people just – you know, drone away in their lives and being productive with it. Would, would you guys agree? When we were first setting up our peer partnership, we would start getting together in, in having just that, thinking moments where we would review one another's financial statements, review where you're at with your life, your health, your fitness, your relationship with your kids. And thinking not just individually, but with the right peer group, thinking becomes just multiplied in effectiveness. So we would take vacations together where we would work one day, play one day, and then work one day the next just to really focus. And Tim, it almost broke his heart one day. He was in Steamboat with me, and then we had a, like a 10-inch powder day, but we'd agree to work. And he worked that day. But man, he, he let us know about it every, you know, every time we talked to him for Still about does. 10 years. The, the new rule is we, we may get up early and do goals. We may do them late at night, but we get the goods. In the woods. <laughs> in the woods. <laughs> and and, and do, how many of you like that? Do you guys like that piece of it? Yeah. And, and I'll interject really quick. One of the things that I, I did, this was about probably a year and a half, two years ago, I met somebody very, very exceptionally successful, uh, um, was running a company, and uh, what they told me blew my mind. Yeah, I was busy working you know, ridiculous hours running my business, and he said, St stop doing what you're doing. Like, I take a full day off every single week from being at the company. Um, and this may not work at all stages, but it certainly worked at, at latter stages, and for me, it was incredibly powerful. Um, I would take my Wednesdays off. I started taking my Wednesdays off. I didn't go into work. I didn't, you know, I would check a little bit of email, maybe, if it's just the bare minimum. And that time was spent thinking, reading, learning, developing, and fostering relationships. None of that time was spent doing busy work. I think that allowed me to grow and allowed the company to grow dramatically. That time is so important. Like, we're, you know, we're, we're trained to think that you 
just do, right? Success is not doing. In order to become successful, you really need to spend time thinking. You have to. We, we, our education system, you know, the, 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 the business gurus out there, don't, I, I really don't believe put enough emphasis on this. And, and it's weird because every successful business person I've ever met spends more time thinking than doing anything else. Um, so I just, I just want to put that out there. And I, I'd, I'd be love curious to what you back on that. that. Um, to me, it's, it's, it's thinking with an elevated heart rate out in the boonies. Um, that's, where you, that's where you have <laughs> to go back to the goods in the woods. Yeah, no. Right no, now, but there's done, they've done so many studies on dude, that. It's, yeah, on it's, when, it's, when you think while doing activity. Yeah, it's and huge. think about taking the time. It's, it's kind of like sacred selfishness to take the time to, to figure out who in the heck am I? And am I in the right place for where I'm supposed to be? And where might I need to course correct? Yeah. Right, let's hit the next pillar. Accountability. Yeah. <laughs> so actually, I was going to go there. It was accountability. That's what I want to ask you guys about. One of the things that's very unique about GoBundance, and I really haven't experienced it anywhere else, is the level of transparency you have to have to be in the group. I mean, you have to share what your net worth is, what it changed from the year before, what your passive income is, what your weight is, what your goals are for all of these pillars, right? How your relationship is with your wife. Like, yeah. Like that. I mean, that, that comes up a lot, right? People are talking about things that they're not comfortable talking about most of the time. And what I find is that you share what you have going on and you have five or six other badass people who are now giving you advice that may be succeeding in areas you're struggling. Can you guys share with us how you, you started that and how you feel like it's benefited your goals, in, like including your real estate investing? You know, we just built layer upon layer. We uh, started with Pat and I just doing money, wealth, accountability, productivity, building our businesses. We met Tim. Tim added in the health and the bucket list adventures. We got sick of going to conferences with like just, they were talking head to us all the time. So we started having our own retreats where we'd go through our one sheets. Um, and then we added um, passive or pa horizontal, horizontal income. Yeah, we added, I mean, goals, bucket list. We added everything. Basically, we got together Genuine with Rock Thomas and Mike McCarthy, and we came up with something called a one sheet, which is a baseball card. Imagine a baseball card on the front. You got this guy with great teeth, looking great, <laughs> holding a baseball, right? And you're like, man, hey. You know, you flip it over and it says it's stats, you know, everything about them, you know, and that's what it was. It was like wearing a baseball card on your own back that everybody could see. But we found that without the transparency, you couldn't have authenticity. Without authenticity, you can't grow. And so you see, you meet a lot of successful people and they just act like they're the greatest thing since sliced bread. They drive a Lamborghini. They got the nice Rolex watch, whatever. Everything's perfect in their life. And you're like, wow, that guy looks amazing. And then you find they're divorced two years later or they're in jail because they were doing coke or something crazy like that. And they were never honest with something. If they'd come to us and said, hey, I'm doing really well, but I think I'm going to do a bunch of Chances Vegas, are that they probably aren't going to meet their relationship work. And maybe if they come to us, we'd say, dude, you should be successful. But instead of doing the blow and going to Vegas, <laughs> you should maybe like... Find a place to contribute. Go to church. Do something charitable in your community. Why don't you come with us and go hike in the woods? You know, you can't help anyone if they don't tell you. What drives me crazy is people get up and they put up this image that everything's fine. Yeah. Be real. If you've got problems, share them and we can help you. But if you're not honest about it, no one can freaking help you. And these guys have helped me like brothers. The in, one sheet is impervious to BS. And, I mean, it's right there. And the, and the coolest thing about these two is they're extremely tough mastermind buddies. You cannot come weak. You cannot say you're going to do something and not do it. Pat Hyben will call you a false prophet of, of the, the highest, highest order. order. <laughs> <laughs> F-P-H-O. And, and, and David, a few years ago, picked, picked on something that, that uh, was a weakness I needed to work on. And at first it, it hurt and, I, and it, and it forced me to dig deep, um, make some changes, and I thank them for it. And, and think about that in your mastermind group, in your peer partnership. Or do they really stand for you? There, there's been times all three of us have stormed out of a room or a hike or an auditorium or something because of something one of the three of us said. And, uh, you know, we're all still together, but it's something that, you know, initially we were defensive about and eventually came around. Okay, so just really quick on this accountability thing again. Um, it, you know, for, for, I keep going with the average guy. Um, that's you. Uh, so for the average guy or gal, you know, it is scary. It is scary to reveal these things. I mean, sharing your net worth. I mean, people don't even talk about money anymore. People don't talk about anything, right? It's, it's verboten. So how does somebody who's never done this before, who's not going to join this organization, but who thinks the idea of finding somebody to work with, how do you do that? How do you begin to open up 
How do you peel the onion uh, on yourself and share that with somebody that you don't know? Because you don't when you're first meeting somebody, when you're first developing these relationships. How do, how do you really do that and, and feel safe and, you know, let that relationship foster? I, I, you know, I, I don't know if you can really answer that question. It's, it's, it's kind of like you're in or you're out. I mean, the, like we say, a lot of people spin out. I mean, I'll be honest. It was terrifying for me early on. I was afraid. I was hiding. I, I, uh, I had an I- illegitimate kid or a kid that was eight years old that I didn't know till she was eight. Whoa. No, well, not the word. I didn't know her until she was, I used to tell people I had a niece. I was embarrassed. I was a young man. Yeah, I, when I first met him. I would call it. I called my. She just come back in my life, right? She came back in my life, and I'm like, wow, I've got a niece. I'd say I got a niece because I was afraid of being judged for having screwed up at a, as a 19 year old and had a kid out of wedlock, right? So I was embarrassed by that. And I slowly. So you're going to be afraid. You just got to. If you want to win, you got to face the fear and start opening up. And today, it's so easy for me to be transparent, obnoxiously so, as you pointed out. But um, it's because all the wins I've got in life have been from being willing to be vulnerable. Even my relationship with my wife has gotten so better. If I hadn't told my buddies in my tribe, hey, I'm struggling here. I don't know how to get my wife to be a really good assistant like I'm trying to get her to be. And all my friends educated me, dude, you are an idiot. Really? You need to go in a different direction. And I slowly soaked it in over multiple years. Me and Tim years. took bets on the divorce. And now I understand. <laughs> I hope you paid off. I know you were betting against me, but now I realize that I'm my wife's assistant. The light has shone on me. And so I'm here to serve her, and it's been a game changer for me. I have the best relationship I've ever had. And about six years ago, I'm like, it was so tough, I wasn't sure I was going to make it. And that's because of transparency. So now, of course, I'm addicted to transparency. Yeah. Because all the goodness comes from it. That's great. Well, speaking of relationships, talking about your wife there, I want to talk about one of the other pillars here is authentic relationships. You know, whether that's with our spouse or as a father or, you know, if you're listening as a mother, uh, how does that play into the, you know, I guess your, each of your lives. I mean, like, you have any tips or stories or, you know, just, how is that a big part of your life? Well, one thing we found, like when our wives first got together, the, the six of us got together, they were all blown away going, we all married the same guy. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. That is so true. And think about the same thing happened when we started the, the, go, wi- wives. the go wives. And, and it takes a special lady to put up with, with our high energy personality and a lot of you can relate so so that was something that um i think it helped us having them be part of it and having them meet every now and then and if you are part of a mastermind it's good to get together and it's good to get together with the spouses and get so, to know so the families. back to the question an authentic relationship you got to be an authentic person in the relationship to have it so if you give it it's reciprocity. The law of reciprocity, you'll get it back. No facades, no bullshit. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. And there, I'm so grateful to guys in this room that have helped me with that. I mean, really. And to be a better father, too. Like, there's a lot of guys in here. Like, you gotta, your kids are number one. You only get them a short period of time. Somebody said to me the other day, you got nine more summers with, your, with Bella. Nine. Nine. Nine more summers. Yeah. And that, I'm grateful for that. Yeah. That's deep. Yeah, we, we, we had a great conversation with Jesse Itzler on the podcast. What was it, show 313? Yeah, yeah. I think it was Something show like that. One of the numbers. 313. <laughs> <laughs> um, and he, he talked about that. Um, you know, you've only got so many minutes in your life. If you think about it, you know, I'm 42 years old. Statistically, I've got less than 40 summers left. Statistically, I've got less than X amount. I mean, yeah. you start thinking about life and numbers like that. It changes everything. And by the way, and by the way, just to go off topic for a second, then I'll move it back on. Uh, you mentioned the GoWise. So GoBundance, for the people listening to the show, GoBundance is a, uh, was for a long time mostly a men's organization. There's 150-some a, a millionaire men in this group. There is now a female version of it as well. So what was that email address for that lady? Jamie. Jamie.hope. Oh, say it again, Jamie. Jamie.hope. Jamie.hope. At gmail.com. All right. So and we got some grief for not having ladies, but let me tell you why. Yeah. If you got four guys being honest and a pretty girl comes and sits down at the table, <laughs> what do you think happens to that honesty most of the time? Yeah. The authenticity goes out the window, we found, with women in Man, the Man, I got problems so- at work. Chick sits down. Oh, it's going amazing. I'm going to be a billionaire in no time. You should see my Lamborghini I got out front. Energy People. just wasn't the same. So rather than bring them in, we created a, a, a separate, separate division. Yeah. Abundance women because cool. we didn't want to seem like we were sexist. because they're going to be more authentic with themselves being all women than with dudes, all, you know, in the room. Yeah. Now, if we could only bridge the divide, <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that's an important principle that the listeners can take into their own lives when they want to go start their own little private mastermind or go to their own meetups and start talking to other investors. You don't want to be that transparent with someone that you just feel you can't trust. 
If you've got somebody in the group and you don't think they're being honest or you don't think they're going to hold you accountable or the whole time they're just talking about themselves and they're not pouring back into you, don't think that just being in a mastermind itself is going to get you somewhere, right? It's what it can do for you. And I think that that's part of why you need to put a lot of time and effort into the people you're going to hang around. Because like, like, like Tim said about David, I like to water ski in other people's wake. A guy like Dave makes a big wake and there's a lot of opportunity there for people that are around him. And I would say for a lot of people that are listening and you're not hitting your goals, you're not getting where you want to go, you're probably not around anybody else's wake at all. You're probably trying to make your own way and you're not a very strong swimmer. And getting around the right people will have a huge, huge change in your life. Dude, I wouldn't Great be that metaphor. half the man I am today if Pat Hyven didn't kick my ass on a regular basis when I was a young up-and-coming guy and didn't know my head from my butt. Yeah, ditto. Yeah, both these guys. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. That's um, all right, let's move on to age-defined health. One of the other pillars, age-defined health. What do you guys do for taking care of your bodies and your uh, your health these days? Well, Tim just runs around getting the goods in the woods. <laughs> <laughs> you, but, uh, you, you know, life is just all about, stay active. Yeah, energy. We're very active. We added that pillar because you can't build a successful business, as you were saying earlier, without health. Like you got to have your health. If you want to win big, you got to win physically in order to have maximum energy to put to work, to put to use to your family, to serve others, to serve the community. So we started paying attention to that thanks to Tim. And uh, now it's nutrition, it's exercise, it's just all the little things. And Dave, I'm so busy. I mean, I, how, how can I do that? I'm, I'm busy. I wake up, I work at my company, I do it all day long. I mean, how's that even possible? Well, would you like to have an extra 20 years to work? Because if you don't take care of your body, you're going to die 20 years young. Yeah. Touche. Just make it happen. And, and then have a group where that's normal. Like at our groups, at our meetings, we always go ski before we meet. We ski all day. We start the meetings at 4 and run till 10 or 11. Yeah, it's a time management thing. Yeah. I mean, how's Mark Wahlberg work out four hours a day? Yeah. Did you see his schedule? <laughs> Woo. Yeah. I made a video it's on time it. Time management, dude. It's yeah. time management. Yeah, it is. And you learn okay. that by being around guys that are doing it. Very cool. All right, so we went through age-defined health, authentic relationships, bucket list adventures. Where's your favorite place, each of you, that you've been on bucket list adventures? And what is a bucket list adventure? Uh, uh, so bucket a bucket list, list adventure. So we don't, like, okay, so there's, we, we just had 27 guys in this room uh, get back from Japan. <laughs> and, um, you know, there was a time, obviously, in the beginning, we thought, uh, David and I went to Africa with Mike, and we're like, we're weird. No one else could get away from their relationships for two weeks and go climb Kili. And then we found, oh, no, there's a lot of weird people like us, you know? And so when we go on these vacations, we're like nonstop, and we do rather than see. So we're constantly doing things like samurai sword fighting or going to some spiritual retreat under cold water in, in the middle of the jungle in Japan or riding Mario Karts through Tokyo and day after day of ADD activities. Those to us are bucket list adventures. While we're riding through Japan, tw 27 of us on a bus going over our one sheets holding their, each other accountable. Yeah, talking about net worth and weight and, and body fat and relationships with our wives and everything. Why on our way to the Mario Karts. What, why, why is that important? Why, why, because why is it important to get To be to successful this? in life, you have to be able to shift consciousness, right? 5% of people are successful, so that means 1 out of 20. So they've had a shifted consciousness to success. By going to a foreign country and throwing yourself in a completely alien place and getting fully engaged in a different culture or climbing a mountain or whitewater rafting in Norway, you are forcing yourself out of your normal state. You're breaking all your patterns. You're then having conversations with high-minded guys that are successful entrepreneurs, which opens up your mind to new possibilities. When you come back to work, you're reborn, refreshed, and ready to go with a new perspective and a new appreciation of life. What if you can't afford it? Like, what if somebody does, doesn't have the money to go on a Go to the freaking Grand, Grand Canyon. When I was poor, I drove to the Grand Canyon. When I was having depressed moments, I would go hike in some place like Big Bend National Park. It didn't cost me crap. Yeah. Yeah. And, and we, you know, we, we've had a lot over the years, Brandon. You and I have chatted a lot about Four Hour Work Week, a book I finally read after Good job. <laughs> much prodding. Um, and I, I think one of the things that Tim Ferriss captured best for me was, you know, life is not just about work, right? I mean, if you want to live your life, you've got to experience, you've got to feel, you've got to get emotion, right? That, that's why work do this. Work funds life. That's all. There you Not go. the other way around. Or, you know, a lot of people, like, they, their entire life is work. You work to that's live, you don't to live do. to work. There you go. I like that. That's what I was trying to say. <laughs> you cleaned it up for me. What Thanks. he said. All right, so the last one. We went through uh, age of fine health. We went through authentic relationships, bucket list adventures, extreme accountability. We talked about horizontal income. And the last one was genuine contribution. What does that have to do with wealth? I mean, like, we're not, why would you give away money 
if you want to be wealthy. Well, they say the great ones spend the first half of their life making it and the second half giving it back. And, and so if you think about that, like, like, and I know a lot of listeners are, are on that path we were, but along the way, why not give back? Why not find um, who could use the, the mindset that we have and reach down and lift them up? So that's what GoBundance has done. We have a charity called OneLifeFullyLive.org. It's the number one, OneLifeFullyLive.org. And that's GoBundance's charity of choice. And what we do is we take the teachings of GoBundance and bring that to people who never get this message. And that's something to check out. We have a conference this fall, October 11th through 13th in Long Beach, California. Please check us out and we'd love to see you there. Everything we do is dirt cheap. So you will get on a plane and come join us. And if you can't ch- come to GoBundance, why not go to One Life? So a life, a life without contribution is not a life worth living. I mean, the reason to be a great business person is so you can make a great difference in your community. On every international trip we go on, we spend a contribution day. When we were in Vietnam, we re-roofed a school and played with the kids. When we were in Peru, we went to a mountain village and we built fire pits and replaced roofs. And they probably didn't need us there. We were probably useless, but we paid for it all. And we got the benefit of being in the cold, wet mud and using to hold the bricks together and mud. And then like, so these people, they were guys, they were, they were dying because they were cooking over o- open fires. They don't, they can't afford a closed fire. So we built like seven and we paid for like 15 or something like we that. We just sent $20,000 to Patagonia and, and so they could buy lumber and stuff. And we're going to build a house there this year together. We're all going to, we're going to build a house. And you know what the favorite house day for, for everybody on these trips is? The contribution day. Yeah. Why? Well, like how, how, because it's meaning. It gives you meaning. What does that, what does that mean? Though? Like, so, is, so, is it a feeling? Is it, what, what, so we, what built, is it? we built these stoves. The people are helping us, kind of laughing at our incompetence. But we're working. We're contributing. And then all the kids came and played with us. We taught them how to play ultimate frisbee on the frisbee court. And they're, it's just fun. You just, you're doing it for no money. You're not making a thing from it. But you're committing and contributing to a community of people. And it's just touching. And, and these are people who, who never had hot water. Yeah. Like they had, they had hot water on them. Uh, open fire, but never saw where we were able to make a little faucet in their house and water came out and it was hot and they couldn't figure out in their heads how that happened. They were perplexed. So, you know, the, the thing that I take away from it is, is something that I'm, I'm deep into right now, which is this exploration of happiness. And, and it, it seems to me that the giving back part is a contribution to the happiness, right? You, you, you derive joy out of, you know, you, you've built this wealth, or, or even if you haven't yet done that, you know, giving of your time creates some kind of joy in you, I, I believe. You um, think you're giving to them, but you actually receive so much more it's back. It's a little selfish for a lot it of people. Is. Yeah, it's it, unbelievable. You yeah. feel amazing. And, yeah. and it's the most underrated gift there is. It really is. Mm. So I add one more piece to that. Um, when I was doing research a while back for the journal that we launched, The Bigger Pockets, recently, and I came across this article from, uh, I wish I knew the guy I don't have it in front of me because we're live in front of a bunch of people, but uh, this uh, New York Times columnist, whatever, did this research uh, where they studied people who gave away money. And not only does like, giving make you happier and does it, make you, it makes you healthier and all these things, but it actually makes you wealthier. So they did this study and said an average family, and, and I'm probably going to butcher the exact number, basically if there's two identical families, everything's the same about them but one gives an extra hundred dollars they will earn back like an extra 300 bucks like just the act of giving away money does something in our human heads that releases maybe it's our hold on money or the way we view money and actually makes us earn more money mm, and far more than we gave the more generous i've been the more money i've made just yeah, consistently through my entire life yep there's something about that and that's why i think like every religion has something about that in there i mean every faith is it says it over and over and over it's better to give than to receive and to, to it's good to donate you know and it's again maybe that's a selfish way of looking at it but it's almost more of a you know if somebody's saying well i don't want to give money away because i don't you know i don't have much will give and then you'll likely have more. I mean, not, not, it's not a guarantee, but it's a, it's a mindset thing. Yeah. Hey, last question. My, my last question. On, on <coughs> Whoa. Sorry. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> I am son. sorry to the editor. <laughs> Apologies. You guys are all extremely successful, particularly you three. <laughs> I mean, David over here, like, hey, look at us. <laughs> They're pretty good. We got a microphone. What, what drives you? What? 
What gets you waking up every day, working, building? I mean, you, you got 73 horizontal lines of whatever the heck, you know, income that you guys are, have, have got. I, I mean, wh- why do you continue working? What, what motivates you to keep doing that? Why do you give away, you know, why not sit on a beach and, and well, you hang out in the woods and do your thing. Good. How about these two? He meets animals. <laughs> well, he actually gives a lot back to uh, One Life Fully Lived. He puts money, time, treasure into that on a massive scale. He, what, you should not underestimate that. Uh-huh. You know, for me, it's like the gamification of life. It's, you know, <coughs> can I ha- be an incredible dad, a great husband, contribute to my community, give away a ton of money, build businesses, make money. For me, it's as much seeing new guys come up in my organization that I help create opportunities for that they take ownership of, seeing them win. It's a fulfilled life, man. If you don't want to stop, like I took a vacation the other day and after the seventh day, my daughter was telling me what to do. My wife was telling me what to do. She was like, this is what retirement would be like. If I didn't have a job, I'd be at home. My kids would be telling me what to do and my wife would be telling me what to do. I'd rather make a difference in the world on a massive scale. Good for you. Pat? I'm, I'm kind of in the middle between these guys. I mean, the older I get, the, the, the more I dislike working, you know, to be honest with you. I, I, just, I, just, I just don't like it. You know, I don't need to. You know what I mean? I don't, and, and so I'm... I'm I'm grow, I'm growing in that direction. So, I, but I think I, I think we're just born this way. I don't, you know, I don't know if anything what about drives you, me other than just being Pat Hyben. I'll, I'll let Tim go first, and then I'll answer. Um, I wake up every morning between around five o'clock and say, "Let me at him to um, make a difference in the lives through one life," and that's that's what's driving me now. It, it was real estate, and then it was getting the goods and the family. And I'm still got the family and stuff, but the one life's what gets me up every morning. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for me, so when I was uh, like 22, I remember having this horrible job. I hated it. I look forward. I, I mean, I dread going to work. I'd get to work, stare at the clock. I mean, some of you all know what I'm talking about. You're just like, how is it only 8.05? You know, and like you, you watch it all day long moving. Uh, and my wife at the time had this car. It didn't defrost very well. She had to drive to Starbucks at 3.30 in the morning where she worked. And she'd have to stick her head out the window. And it's like, you know, 25 degrees and raining. And the only way she could get to work is by sticking her head out the window. I remember what that was like. And it sucks. Like, I know a lot of people are like, I was so happy when I was poor. And I, I'm not saying wealth makes you happy, but that sucked. And I don't want people to go through that. Like, I remember, and I'm like, if I can help more people go from that, and, and not just the, the money and whatever, just like the, the life of pain. And I use the word pain in, in the full sense of the word of like any discomfort or problems or whatever, relational, I mean, any of these pillars, right? To move from that to abundance, that's what I'm just... That's what drives me, David. I think that you're going to experience pain one way or another. You're going to experience the pain of transparency and accountability and commitment and feeling like an idiot because every time you start something new, you always suck at it no matter who you are. Nobody picks up a snowboard and crutches it on their first try. Um, Or you're going to experience the pain of regret and your life being harder than it needs to be because you didn't do the things in the beginning and you're sticking your head out the window of your car as you're driving around, it's cold, right? So you kind of got to pick your poison. You're going to pay for it one way or the other. What's cool about joining a group of people that are on the same journey as you is pain is always better when there's someone to share in the suffering. I mean, the best relationships I have were the guys that I went to the police academy with and went through uh, working on the force with or played basketball with. There's something about intense suffering that bonds people together and makes it easier to go through. For the lone wolves that are out there and they don't want to be transparent, I would just say you're making your life harder and let that pain drive you to get over the things that are preventing you from taking those steps forward. That's good. And Josh, what do you think? What, what drives you? I think what drives me today is a little different than what drove me before. I, today, I, I chatted with the, the di- different group earlier here um, and uh, talked about happiness. Um, and and uh, that's, what, that's what drives me. And it's not just the, the quest for my own happiness. I, I think it's the quest to help people be happy. And, and as, I, as I look back, you know, 14 years ago when I started Bigger Pockets, and, and before that when I was a teacher, um, I, I think what I realized about myself is I derive joy from helping people uh, learn, helping people succeed. Um, and for me, it's, it's a little, little selfish, as, as I was saying earlier. I, I, I mean, but it's not always fun, um, but I, I get joy out of doing that. Um, and so... Um, what drives me today is is kind of this quest to 
solve my own happiness, figure out, you know, how do I become a happier person? Uh, how do I uh, help my children and my wife be happier, my family, my community, my friends? Um, and then, you know, I mean, we've got a big old megaphone. You know, how do, I, how do I help thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people figure out what it means? How do we stop being so mad and angry and stressed all the time with each other? You know, how do we kind of kumbaya, right? How do we come together? Yeah. And dear, because, you know, life is short and nobody's got time for all that anger. That's good. All right, so I want to transition this to the last segment of the, sh- segment of the show. We've got to get out of here soon. I know we're way over our time. Uh, and the last segment of our show is something that we lovingly refer to as our famous four. Like that? It's pretty good, right? All right, this is the part of the show where we ask the guests every single week the exact same questions, four questions. We're going to fire them quickly at you guys uh, and let you just each answer. Uh, question number one, I'll go, and then we'll just, I guess, move down. Uh, favorite real estate-related book other than anything you've written? And it, if you don't have one, that's fine. You can just say, you know, nothing comes to mind. But cash flow quadrant. Cash flow quadrant. Kiyosaki, all right. Yeah. Or retire young, retire rich. Richest man in Babylon. Love the love the pillars that it taught. Love it. How to invest in real estate? <laughs> <laughs> How to invest in real estate? There we go. Look at that. Wow. I just forgot that one. It just came. <laughs> to me. Damn, we blew it. All right. Well, you get you get a chance to redeem yourselves. What is your favorite business book? Mm. Um, wow think it grow rich or you know that's not really a business book yeah it is that think it grow rich yeah sure I mean the classics are I still love the as a man thinketh is my number one book you know I keep that in my car and read it at stoplights I mean it's just I can keep reading over and over (laughs) because it's better than texting honking you (laughs) yeah yeah. Uh, (laughs) I love the e-myth because oh, of uh, it, and and I think with one life fully live, we're trying to teach people the business of their life. If you think about that, that's good. All right, you. No, oh, that's my turn. Hobbies. What do you do for fun? Um, golf and adventure travel. I have a new puppy, and I walk her like twelve <laughs> times a day. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Tim. I'm a skiaholic. Kids in the woods. Our last question of the day. And I'll ask each of you this. What do you believe sets apart successful, I'll call it not just real estate investors, but just successful people from those who give up on their dreams, they fail once they get started, or they just never get started? What separates those people? If you had to boil it down. Uh, I think an open-mindedness, a growth-mindedness, a willingness to look like a fool. You're going to look like a fool all the time. And if you're willing to step into that foolishness, you'll grow. And if you want to hide from it, you'll stay the same or shrink. And I think it's a hunger to make money and, and a hunger to, to keep going until you make money. And then when you do make money, don't blow it, you know, invest it. <laughs> yeah. And I'd say it's a hunger to learn and just to surround yourself with the people who can take you there and the courage to reach out to who in your town is the best investor that you could buy breakfast or lunch with and call them right now. Yeah, that's great. And call, call people out right now. Whatever, Boom. You're, whatever you're doing right now, pause this episode. Pick up the phone. Call somebody. All right. Well, thank you guys so much. Can I just get yeah, a round of applause you. for these guys? I mean, every, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Love you guys. Namaste. And that is our show. For the first time ever, this is David Green for Brandon and Josh signing off. That was weird. <laughs> you wanted to do that? Did you want to do the outro, Josh? Are you sad? I don't, I don't do you know. Feel awkward? It just feels kind of weird. <coughs> all right. Well, thank you all for joining us for this episode. Was that fun? You like that? <laughs> Woo! Get to see behind the scenes much. a little. We good? Thank you. I think we're good to go. Oh, questions? Is there Q&A? Hey, can we give it up, guys? Woo! Can we give it up? <laughs> awesome, you Thanks, guys. guys. Awesome. You were awesome upstairs. Hey, Pat. Stay up here. Stay up here. Josh, awesome. Stay up here. You're listening to Bigger Pockets Radio, simplifying real estate for investors large and small. If you're here looking to learn about real estate investing without all the hype, you're in the right place. Stay tuned and be sure to join the millions of others who have benefited from BiggerPockets.com, your home for real estate investing online.